hydroxychloroquine, the disease modifying anti diabetes age and in type 2 diabetes mellitus. So, I invite Dr. Sanjay Reddy to deliver his lecture on this topic. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank, the, thank Dr. Vinay Krishnan and Chellaram's Diabetes Institute for inviting me here and the chairpersons for the kind words. It's very difficult to follow Krishna. He makes a difficult story very nice and interesting. Now what we have is all the time what we saw, what Krishna presented was, is what inflammation, chronic inflammation does and what happens in diabetes. Do we have, do we have any therapeutic agents? He did talk about all of them in one slide, saying that we've been using these therapeutic anti-inflammatory agents from salicylates and everything else. But do we have data on something which is there for more than 50 years? And let us look at hydroxychloroquine in the management of type 2 diabetes. Do we have data and what do we see? Now, you, we, we all know the principal link to multiple chronic conditions, and he pointed out rightly in his earlier slides, it's an amalgamation of all this. I'm not going to detail about the slide. Inf inflammation contributes to insulin resistance, beta cell dysfunction, and onset of type 2 diabetes. And Krishna put it in a very nice story about FOXO, adiponectin levels, uh, um, all the interleukins, and so on. All these cause an increase, as you know, cause increased FFA, reduced adiponectin, increased leptin, higher demand for insulin, elevated cytokines and chemokine, all this ultimately leading to some sort of pancreatic beta cell dysfunction. And we do have, these contributors are inflammation. Now, inflammation and microvascular complication of type 2 diabetes, all of you have seen this slide, and we all know that inflammation is one of the key pathway in this. Now, this is an observation which came out in JAMA a long time ago. They saw that patients who receive hydroxychloroquine as a DMARD for rheumatoid arthritis, when they followed these patients over a long period of time, approximately 21 years, they did found that people who used hydroxychloroquine for rheumatoid arthritis developed less diabetes than the people who didn't use hydroxychloroquine as the DMARD. On the similar basis, we have a study funded by the RSSDI working in terms with the rheumatologist at Bangalore. A couple of centers are involved. We're trying to look at uh, a prospective study for the next five years. We've presented the interim results, a couple of, uh, at RSSDI, saying what happens to people with rheumatoid arthritis, same A1Cs, on hydroxychloroquine versus people with diabetes, not on hydroxychloroquine, do they progress lesser? Do they have lesser microvascular complication? We need to wait for that for another two and a half years. Now, we know hydroxychloroquine is present, and we've been using the last 50 years as one of the DMARDs in rheumatoid arthritis and other rheumatoid conditions. Now, what happened is hydroxychloroquine, if you look at the earlier labels too, be wary of hypoglycemia, is one of the side effects mentioned in hydroxychloroquine. Now, it was approved for, type, for use in type 2 diabetes in two, 2014 by the DCGI. Now, I'll take it from there. How does hydroxychloroquine act? Now, there are four ways of which, in which hydroxychloroquine acts. One, it inhibits insulin degradation, decreases, improves insulin sensitivity, reduces inflammatory markers, and preserves beta cell preservation. Do we have data on this? Do we have some... Data. Now, what happens when inhibition of insulin degradation is a systematic diagram. Insulin, when after it binds to the receptors, internalization of receptor insulin complex in the endostinal vesicle, insulin dissociation from its receptor. When you give HCQ, there's alkalization which happens at the level of the receptor, uh, at where, the, where the binding of the receptor to insulin happens, and there is more insulin available, HCQ causes alkalization, resulting in inactivation of this insulin degradation enzymes. So there, is, there is more insulin left and less insulin, which is de degraded, so that we have more insulin. And this may improve glycemic outcomes. Now what happens to anti-inflammatory fa factors? All these anti inhibit cytokine production, we are all aware of this, IL-1, IL-60, and F-alpha, inhibits TRL activation, reduces CRP levels, inhibits prostaglandin synthesis, inhibits leukokine activation, and inhibits leukocyte migration. 
Another thing which also does is it increases adiponectin levels, which I will show you in a couple of studies, which have been learned later. Now, what happens to beta cell function and insulin sensitivity? One of the, the CLAMP studies which showed that HCQ improves both beta cell function and insulin sensitivity in non-diabetic or pre-diabetic individuals. These metabolic effects may explain why HCQ treatment is associated with the lower risk of type 2 diabetes. And one of this one novel study and the one observation which came out from it was increase in adiponectin levels and we listened to Dr. Krishna Sheshadri who clearly told us what happens to adiponectin in inflammation. It goes down, so this is a beneficial effect of HCQ. Now do we have anything on beta cell mass? Now I, we are all two like rats, I like the statement from Krishna. Now when you look at uh, uh, beta cells in diabetic rats versus HCQ treated diabetic rats. Look at the beta cells, those who receive HCQ to the ones which do not receive HCQ. There's an increased mass of beta cells in patients who received, uh, in rats who received HCQ, or two leg -like patients, or two leg -like rats as we are. So, hydro and there are many studies which have shown that hydroquinone uh, HCQ has most abundant evidence for metabolic benefits. These are these three R RCTs done over six, 18, and 24 months, which have shown that they have an A1C reduction which is present. They are new and they are older drugs, cheaper and can be used in these studies. Let us look at more data. Now, what are the studies done till date? We have some international studies studies of Indian origin, some ob observational studies, and some case reports. I will take you in the next five to seven minutes on various studies done till date and what is the data which we have. In the first study on HCQ was done in 1990 by Gautra et al. which said, what they did was they took patients who were on insulin and sulfonylurea. For some of them, they've added HCQ and for some of them, they didn't add hydroxychloroquine. They did fine. There was a decrease in A1C and insulin reduction came down drastically by 30% in the group which received hydroxychloroquine. In another double bind study, this is 1990, believe me gentlemen, 29 years ago. And in another study, they, in six months, addition of HCQ 300 BID reduced A1C by absolute of 1.02 more than placebo these patients were all receiving maximal dose of sulfonylurea. Earlier studies when no other drugs were available at that particular point of time. Now, this is a randomized double-blind placebo control trial of hydroxychloroquine versus placebo. Baseline characteristics were patients about eight, type two diabetes more than 12 months, inadequately controlled on true drugs, that's metformin and glimepiride. 20 of them, they were randomized either to receive HCQ 400 or placebo, and what, what did we see? We see a significant reduction in glycemic parameters, both fasting, postprandial, and an A1C of minus 1.3 compared to placebo of 0.6. So this was the study initially done. And what we did find was there was a reduction in A1C. There were no major <coughs> hypoglycemic episodes in both treatment harm. Now as a third line drug, when you have two drugs, can we compare it with already existing molecule like pioglitazone? This study was done in patients who were on maximal tolerated metformin and sulfonylurea. In one of the arms, they added uh, pioglitazone to another arm, HCQ was given, and the results showed that HCQ reduced A1C levels by 1.2%. Both drugs were well tolerated and significantly improved glucose function. Pioglistone caused more weight gain, which is known. HCQ can be beneficial in uncontrolled type 2 diabetes as a third line agent. Now, what is the first? The first Indian phase 3 study is, was also in comparison with pioglitazone. The patient population were similar to the one done earlier. Here, they used H HCQ 400 versus pioglitazone 15 milligrams per day. 806 patients were assessed for eligibility out of it, 267 were randomized, 135 on hydroxychloroquine and 132 on pioglitazone. Type two diabetes on two drugs and each of the arms 
they were assessed separately. And what did we define? What was the change from baseline? If you look at it, there was a significant decrease in fasting as well as postprandial hyperglycemia, uh, hyperglycemia and a decrease in A1C at 12 weeks. At 24 weeks, this was the changes which we saw in the blood glucose parameters. Now, do we have another study where we saw, let they, where this compared it with teneligliptin was used instead of pioglitazone and what were the results? The results were similar or equivocal to that of teneligliptin. This was as effective glycemic control to that of teneligliptin. If you look at both these parameters and look at the A1C reduction, it was similar, one, one, minus 1.6 to minus 1.8. Patients who achieved target A1C, 61 to 42 percent. Now, what we did do find is it can be used in patients who are on insulin, who are on two drugs or failed two drugs, and it was similar to that of pioglitazone, was similar to that of teneligliptin in terms of achieving glycemic eff efficacy. Now, when you look at adding, uh, what would be the optimum dose? Why can't it be 200 milligrams or 400? Why should it be 400? Why can't it be 600 milligrams? It's one of the questions which would come in. Earlier studies used 600 milligrams. Some studies what you, you used were 400. Why was this 400 which came into, uh, uh, why was 400 chosen? There was this dose ranging study which was said, done on patients who had an insulin, glimipride, metformin. You give HCQ 200 versus HCQ 400. Look at the difference. There is a significant difference if you use 400 compared to 200. The maximum, the therapeutic dose achieved was better than that of 200. So 400 would be a better dose. What happens to HSCR? In this study, they also measured HSCRP. There was a significant decrease in HSCRP too. Now, in comparison with other, do we have studies in comparison with other DPP-4 inhibitors? We have a study with citagliptin, vildagliptin, and all of them were similar. Uh, all of the studies showed that there was A1C reduction was similar or e equal in majority of the uh, comparative gliptin studies which have been done with HCQ. Now, there was a recent study which was done called the Tenny hydroxychloroquine SWIFT study. They had two groups of patients where majority of the patients were taking metformin, sulfonylurea, teneligliptin, and some of the patients were even on alpha-glucoside inhibitors as well as SGLT2 inhibitors. Suppose we switch the people who are taking teneligliptin with HYQ was or were not, were not well controlled with this. When the switch happened, did it do better? they did find that the A1C redu reduce, reduction did happen when the switch happened. So it was, it was known that if you s even switch to an enigliptin with HYQ, the results were the same. So significant reductions were also seen in other paras parameters like lipid profile, uh, and which also indicate there could be a chance in reducing CV up outcome risk. But we don't know yet. There are studies ongoing. I will show you what other studies are available. This is a phase four study of the first anti-inflammatory drug approved in India in type two diabetes. There was a phase four study, and patients who received uh, HYQ, if, if the A1C was more than seven, as an add-on to the existing doses of metformin and sulfonylurea, they were divided into two groups based on the HSCRP. If the HSCRP was less than six or less than six, three, to see if HSCRP is one of the indicator to say that who responded better, people with low HSCRP or people with high HSCRP. Both groups were comparable at baseline with respect to mean A1C, fasting, postprandial, and lipids. There was a significant fall in glycemic parameters in both groups, indicating to say HSCRP was, is not, even if it is elevated or less than three, the response rates were the same. And there was also <coughs> change in LDN was sick, but what did they find was the change in LDN was significantly more in the HS, if the HSCRP is more than three. So what happened if you had to basal insulin? We already know from earlier studies, 
If patients were receiving insulin from 1990 at Quattro et al., which showed that there's a decrease in, 30% decrease in insulin usage. So here, patients were taking more than 30 units of basal insulin on sulfonylurea, metformin, and and this one group was handed HYQ and another group placebo. What we did, what did they find was there was reduction in both fasting and postprandial, the reduction in the number of uh, units of insulin use decreased considerably. And in subset of patients, 41% of the patients they could were able to give up uh, the usage of basal insulin. So what this tend to tell us is hydroxychloroquine was well to tolerated toward the study. No case of severe hypoglycemia was reported with this. Now, do we have any guideline recommendation? In 2017, RSSTI clinical guideline recommendation came in on the use of hydroxychloroquine. From July 2014, hydroxychloroquine has been approved by DCJ as an adjuvant to diet and exercise to improve glycemia. In <coughs> glycemic control in patients with type 2 diabetes on issues and metformin combination. It has modest effect on reducing A1C along with reduction of pro-inflammatory markers. It has shown to delay new onset diabetes in rheumatoid arthritis patient. This is the guideline recommendation which came in and looking at our uh, Indian, Asian Indian phenotype with all these factors we all know have been talking since morning and Dr. Krishna also has spoken about all this food, caloric restriction, sleep. If you're not able to do all this and you have diabetes, I think one of the agents which we can use to uh, treat diabetes would be HYQ. These are the trials which are ongoing. This is a 2,500 patient hospital rest for myocardial infarction. They're looking at composite endpoints like CV death, MI hospitalization for unstable angina, a <coughs> CV outcome study, established completion date in December 2019. These are other studies happening in the US and with and uh, Veterans Affairs Office of Research and Development in the US, in uh, United States on patients with CKD. We are yet to get these results. So to conclude, do we do know that inflammation is one of the key factors uh, in the development of diabetes and would play a clean pathogenic role, pathogenesis of diabetes as we keep on understanding. We try and see if we can get new drugs or reinvent new drugs for usage in diabetes. So I think with the data which we have and currently have, we, uh, HYQ can be used as an adjuvant <coughs> with <coughs> metformin, sulfonylurea, DPP-4 inhibitors or insulin, the treatment as an add-on in the treatment of type 2 diabetes and it also known to improve insulin secretion, signaling, too selective targeting of inflammation at mo has modest cardiovascular metabolic benefits. We need to see the cardiovascular outcome trial which HYQ which will be presented later. It is a need of the hour to explore purely anti-inflammatory drug and type 2 diabetes. Thank you very much.